Good evening, welcome. My name is Gabrielle Schad. Uh, I'm happy to see you, uh, Patterson Beckwith, and see you all, our audience, um, for tonight's art talk. It is the second of our season. Uh, we'll uh, also have further talks next week, a short preview uh, before we start here. Um, on 11th of November, we are welcoming Anne Imhof in conversation with my colleague, Dr. Marie-France Raphael. And on uh, 1st of December, we'll talk to Beatrice Gibson, who is a guest lecturer in the Master of Fine Arts program for this semester. Uh, the program hosted by the Department of Fine Arts is a collaboration uh, between staff members from our head of the department, Svetlana Higer Davis, over Raphael Gigax, head of uh, Bachelor of Fine Arts program, to Judith Welter, head of uh, the Master of Fine Arts program. I'm a research associate working in the Bachelor of Fine Arts, and tonight I'm talking to Patterson Beckwith whom I'm briefly introduce with a short bio before he uh, starts with the art talk. Also, as um, every time I'm pointing out that this webinar will be recorded and put online afterwards, so you can point it out to your friends. Um, if you have questions, um, please already take your notes and bring them into the Q&A section or type them into the chat. There will be roughly 15-20 minutes for a discussion with our guest tonight, Patterson. I will be moderating and possibly also throw in some questions. So Patterson Beckwith holds an MFA from Cooper Union uh, in Fine Art from 1994 where he graduated and the uh, Bachelor of Fine Art in Photography, um, accomplished in 2006 from UCLA. He was a founding member of Art Club 2000. He lives and works in New York City as an artist and educator. He thought, he taught and thought at Otis College uh, NYU and Cooper mm -hmm. Union and for over 10 years at City College, part of CUNY, where he holds a tenured appointment in the Department of Art. He works there to run the BA photography area and also teaches in the MFA programs there. His mid 90s public access TV shows made in collaboration with Alex Back, Cash from Chaos and Unicorns and Rainbows were exhibited at the Migro Museum für Gegenwartskunst in uh, 2011 and are in the permanent collection at MoMA in New York City. His book, Bananas for Mohoinaj, was published in 2010 by the Los Angeles County Museum of Art, where his work is in their permanent collection including exhibitions with Art Club 2000 and his own work. He has exhibited his work throughout Europe and the US for over 20 years. He is also the president of an all-volunteer non-for-profit community boathouse in New York, where he works on water quality issues and facilitates access to New York City's waterways for all artists. He is a resident in the works on Waterhouse on New York City's Governor's Island, where a group of artists are promoting a new water art movement dedicated to working with water to bring awareness to the public of the issues and conditions that impact their environment through art. Very warm welcome, Patterson. Uh, thank you for being with us tonight. I shall point out here that this talk is also a collaboration with Kunsthalle Zurich. So thank you also to director and curator Daniel Baumann, um, who um, is the curator um, of a recent retrospective of Art Club 2000, a collective that has already been briefly mentioned working between 1992 and 1999. And AC2K, as the acronym goes, uh, will be presented, um, also 
represented uh, here in this art talk, among other things by Patterson, and we're really looking forward to getting introduced into um, this retrospective at the Kunsthalle Zurich, but also um, in a more general sense into the artistic practice of this artist collective. So thank you, Patterson. Cool. Should I go ahead and share my screen, start showing slides? Please. Okay. Hi, everybody. I just did this. Oh. PowerPoint. Do you see my power? Oh, no, that's not good. Hold on. Uh, do you see my PowerPoint? Yes. Okay, great. Super. All right. Awesome. No, and now you don't want to see that. Okay. All right. So, um, this is Art Club 2000 founding members. And in the center here, you see um, an art dealer named Colin Deland, who passed away in 2005 um, at a young age. So um, uh, that's that. And I think um, probably just sort of setting the stage for all this is important to know a little bit about the, uh, Colin and American Fine Arts. So he was part of a young generation of gallerists um, who had started in the in New York's East Village. So, you know, the, the East Village scene, um, we kind of think of probably Keith Haring, um, Kenny Scharf, who comes up later in my talk, um, Jeff Koons uh, showed, you know, uh, for the first time in the East Village. So there was, this was where the young galleries were at the time. And this is a phenomena in New York that our club explored, but, you know, galleries are constantly moving around, um, trying to find um, cheap enough rents uh, is the short of it. And this has happened, uh, I don't know, approximately five times in my lifetime. So we just have a new movement of galleries to yet another new neighborhood called Tribeca. Um, until recently, all the galleries were concentrated in a neighborhood called Chelsea, which made things very easy because you could just walk around and see most of the galleries there. There's been a decent amount of galleries in the Lower East Side as well um, for the last uh, 10 or 15 years. Um, sorry, so just to say um, at this particular moment, uh, there were a few galleries on 57th Street, some stodgy old time galleries, but almost all the commercial galleries in New York City were in the neighborhood of Soho, uh, which stands for South of Houston Street. And it's a little tiny neighborhood and you could walk up and down one block and another and almost all the storefronts were galleries interspersed with, you know, some restaurants and shirt stores. It's a, a cast iron districts, historic districts, so these kind of beautiful um, lofty um, spaces with wood floors from the 1800s, um, which is old for us right in America. So here we have the first, okay, so American Fine Arts, sorry, was um, a pretty special gallery. Colin was a pretty special um, art dealer. He was, um, he had a fair amount of commercial success, but he was really, um, he was an artist himself. He worked under a couple of pseudonyms. Um, he collaborated with Richard Prince um, as, as an artist named John Dogg, D-O-G-G, -D -D and you can see some work they made together. And then he also worked under the name Jay St. Bernard, where he showed at his girlfriend's gallery, Pat Hearn, who is another important um, East Village art dealer who had moved to Soho. The East Village scene basically died by 89, 90, and the surviving galleries and a lot of them, some of them are still um, surviving to this day, all moved um, to Soho, is, is fair to say. Um, so Colin's interest was in, uh, you could say like idea art, conceptual art, um, experimentation, um, and kind of, yeah, he definitely had a sort of a punk rock sort of attitude and background, um, being his age group, you know, kind of grew up with, you know, punk rock. Um, and so to kind of, you, you know, mess, messing with the paradigm and um, seeking out artists that he thought were doing things that were interesting was much more important to him than um, it's not that he needed to make money, he needed to pay rent. He wasn't a bad art dealer, but he was also had this um, other interest in, you know, doing something with his gallery and with his program. Um, so some of the artists that showed there, some of what you'll have heard of, some of you won't, um, and there is a more extensive list 
online, but like um, probably Katie Nolan might be the most famous. Andrea Fraser, I'll come back to in a second. Um, <clears throat> Peter Fend uh, is still showing today. Um, F-E-N-D, he's an idea artist. Mark Dion is definitely a research-based practitioner. Uh, Jessica Stockholder was showing there and a, a mural artist named Jessica Diamond. We got introduced to the gallery because we were all going to school together. So everybody you see here, besides for the fellow in the center, we were all going to school together at the Cooper Union, which is a free um, four-year college that has gives degrees, um, BFA degrees in uh, fine art. And then they also have a very small architecture school and an engineering school. And it's 100% tuition free. And um, we had a lot of great teachers there and it was in the East Village, like St. Mark's Place um, and basically eight blocks from, so Houston Street is where the numbered street starts in Manhattan. So it was basically eight blocks from Soho. So we would frequently in groups or ones or twos or, you know, we would frequently go around and um, visit gallery shows. This was something that was particularly encouraged by Hans Hacke, who was one of our teachers and ran the sculpture department where we all studied and he would get the mailing. So back in the day, remember everything I'm gonna talk about today is pre-internet, right? So he would get the postcards from the shows and he would meticulously come in and he had preserved a pin board and he would meticulously come in and pin up every card that he got. And, be, and he, you know, he signed up like mailing list, please, and the sign in books at the galleries. And so this was a great resource. There's, there were gallery guides and printed guides you could get. And you could also just walk around and find galleries, but um, this was a great resource that he created for us as a teacher. And so we'd see even sometimes when there was an opening we could go to, or at least um, see that there were shows we wanted to see. We would also follow, you know, print media. So like if there were reviews in the Times every week and listings of shows. We were, as students, we were really engaged with contemporary art, which is something I, I feel like I'm speaking to a student audience, but, you know, I think that worked well for us. It gave us something to kind of riff off of. It was great, you know, we we're fortunate obviously to be in New York City, but I mean, we have a lot of art there. And it's good to see what other, you know, slightly senior artists do, what other artists what's what people are showing what's being successful in the marketplace what's out there whether it's at a museum or a gallery um, but for us you know going around to galleries is fun and easy um, basically kind of recreational activity for us the Andrea Fraser story is kind of a great one we'd never been to American art, fine arts before and a friend of ours who wasn't in the group came was telling everybody you've got to go to this gallery I won't tell you what it is but it's so good and you've just got to go and so this is Andrea Fraser's first show at the gallery, and it's a, a piece called May I Help You? And so that, I believe there's a video you can watch, but the short of it is uh, these um, Christian Marclay uh, surrogate paintings, which are basically cast paintings of nothing. It's just like a frame and a black square. They're really sculptures. Anyway, so there's these surrogate paintings hung around the gallery. And then she had hired actors and they went into this insane monologue and there were three actors dressed up in suits and they would go into this insane sort of quasi art dealer uh, monologue uh, talking about the works and especially talking about what was depicted in the works and since they were all just black um, it was pretty um, humorous and they would sort of try to sell you they would they would just keep going no matter what if you would laugh or and eventually because there were three people you would catch on because somebody else we came in alone when I did it we came in alone and this person walked up to us and started taking us through the show and then somebody else came in and you'd start picking up oh they're all doing the same monologue so we were you know obviously I don't know we were impressed it was this was definitely a cool show Andrew's a great artist and um, did a, several really cool shows there but um, uh, we started going back and seeing shows by the other artists again pre-internet so we had um, Again, back to Hans Hacke organized a very robust visiting artist program, and he had money to bring in um, artists, um, every, different artists every semester as guest artists. And so among those, um, we did have uh, Mark Dion, Gregory Crudson. Um, oh, I'm going to, I'm forgetting people. But anyway, we had, you know, a lot of great contemporary artists that Hans was interested in. He would invite Cooper Union you know, I'll just say it's a little prestigious and a lot of the artists lived in New York and they were actually able to pay them a decent amount. So he was able to get 
um, some pretty cool people. Lorna Simpson, he was able to get cool people in every semester, but we would often research the artists. So um, Mark Dion, for example, showed at the gallery. And so when it was listed uh, for registration for the next semester that he was the guest artist, we marched into the gallery and asked to see his slides. And so at the time there weren't any websites and what you would do is go to a gallery and you're gonna see these are, I think this is even from a slide, you're gonna see you know, scans of slides today, but you would go in and they would have a book full of slides, a binder full of slides, and they would pull out pages of slides and there'd be a light table, maybe a loop, maybe not. And you could go through and look at the artist's work that way. Um, and anybody could do that. You just had to kind of know to ask. And you know, as we kept coming back to the gallery, um, in time, we went around to a few different galleries. We got a couple of us uh, here. Uh, I don't know if I have a way to do a pointer. Do you see my cursor if I do this? No. Yes? No. Yes. Oh, great. So this guy here, Craig, and me, which is this guy here, before 30 years of pizza and cigarettes. Well, no, I was already smoking. But anyway, so there, uh, and he's eating pizza. But anyway, so there, uh, Craig and I uh, went around to a few few different galleries. Um, we already had a job working at the school a couple of days a week that supported us for the summer. And we we're like, why don't we try to do an internship at an art gallery? And um, we went around to a few different galleries. And the person we happened to talk to, we didn't actually talk to Colin, but the person that we talked to at Collins, I decided that we should negotiate for uh, paid lunch. And uh, the person at American Fine Arts agreed to pay for our lunches. And so we went and worked there for the summer. At the end of the summer, um, and after, you know, we'd had some dealings with Colin and worked with him for a while. Um, and this was the year that uh, Matthew Barney broke. And to put things into context, artists, um, with the exception of, um, well, just to say with very few exceptions, artists didn't get to show in galleries until they were in their mid-20s. So Frank Stella's a big exception when he was 24 when he started showing. And then it was a huge deal that Matthew Barney was 24. To us today, even to me, that seems like not a big deal. But at the time, it really was a big part of the narrative surrounding Matthew Barney and his you know, youthful success. And uh, Colin had actually turned down Matthew Barney. Uh, Matthew had actually had his first show in LA at Regan Projects and then his um, first show in, in New York that fall. Um, well, he was like, if a 24 year old can do it, you know, let's see what some 19 year olds could do. So this was, we're definitely, I always use the, um, you know, I try to keep up on whatever the latest thing is, but I guess the monkeys would be like the original reference, the new kids on the block, whatever kind of constructed band you could imagine. This is definitely uh, the format of our club 2000. So um, Colin asked uh, Craig and I to bring some friends down to the gallery one night. We picked some friends. We were careful to try to um, have more women than men and uh, brought everybody down to the gallery. And it's actually one of the women's missing from this portrait for some reason. Um, and Colin proposed to us um, to do a class with him. So this is the beginning of the school year, right after this summer. We would do a class with him, a weekly class. And at the end of that, in the summer, we would have a show. Um, I think it's still the case a little bit. Summer shows. You know, the rich people go off to the Hamptons, they go off on vacation. And so summer shows are a time when you see a lot of group shows, more experimental shows, shows by young artists. A lot of galleries even today still close um, in August. So we did, um, eventually we did a series of seven summer shows at American Fine Arts. So we kind of had this um, slot at the gallery um, and in collaboration with Colin. Colin was not technically a member of the group. We did produce the work. He had as the gallery owner and kind of as our leader, he had a sort of veto power and definitely could, you know, try to direct, direct some of our impulses and interests. We were also, you know, young art students with a lot of ideas of our own. Um, and, you know, we, we made the work, but he was definitely kind of directing um, our efforts. So this is the first work that we made. And this is um, at a Sears, which is like, a, um, I don't know, gosh, well, it's uh, you know it's a it's a it's a story that just sells everything, and so they um, have a portrait center where you could come, and the person working was new and couldn't figure out how to get seven people into the picture, so that's why there's two separate um, pictures here. But early on in the project, and I don't think I have a lot of slides of this here, 
we were all also we were working in sculpture and photography were the two main things we were studying. So early on in the project, the idea that we would just kind of document everything um, came up. Oh, brother. Oh, OK. Um, so and this was stuff we were doing on our own or meeting with Colin. And so this is some early work. Uh, I mentioned we were studying with Gregory Crutzens and we had kind of picked up on the school would lend us these four by five cameras. So a four by five camera is the kind that you have to like, um, you know, you have a hood that you put um, over your head so you can see the image and it's upside down and you have to use a tripod and it's four by five means four by five inches. And so it's a very large negative and it costs, you know, roughly maybe $5 a picture for the film and development. So it's something where you, kind of take your time and maybe don't make as many exposures as you would with a, a handheld camera. So I think I'll, I'll mention it when it's not, but all the images here, um, not, easily 90% of them are taken with this large format four by five um, camera. So this one's called um, Untitled Star Trek Party. And this was included in our first show, but this was also the kind of thing we were doing. So playing around with um, this constructed reality photography, you know, we like paused the tape on a scene we liked and we're you know, posing for this um, as if we're, I mean, we're, we did watch the thing, but we're, you know, this a post photograph. There's actually, we had to, these, these cameras also require a lot of light, right? And I think you can kind of tell this is artificially lit. So we brought in, you know, two light stands and a real big heavy camera, all this stuff. Again, with the constructed reality, um, nothing you're seeing here is real. Like we got the kettle boiling for the steam, set up a light so it'd be backlit. We're, um, Craig here in the foreground, there's nothing in the oven. We're just kind of, you know, uh, yeah, constructed, constructed photography, posed tableau photography. And this was very trendy at the time. A lot of people were doing it. So we're just kind of playing around with that, that genre, I guess, as students. And you see most of art club here. Um, donut shop. So this is crazy. You can imagine it's a big tripod too. So we humped all this equipment. I guess we had a bunch of people with this giant tripod. Maybe we asked somebody, and you can see the great and the prices here for two eggs, any style with coffee, juice, and a donut, two dollars and twenty-five cents. This place has been demolished. Also, the smoking inside the restaurant. So this is Untitled Donut Shop. So it's a series of about twenty-five of these pictures, and um, here's where we have uh, Shannon in the center is dressed as a red fox. I'm a Dalmatian. Um, working counterclockwise is a brown bear in the center, purple um, bunny, um, an elephant. Uh, Gillian here is an elephant. Uh, Sarah is a bird, and Craig's a cheetah. And this actually came out of this class with Mark Dion. We we're talking about human animal relationships. And I basically just asked everybody, what animal do you want to be? And then I bought the pattern for making animal costumes. and made all these animal costumes for everybody. So we use these in a few different pictures, but sorry, credit to uh, Shannon in the red was really good with the phone. And you'll see a few more examples of this. She would just call places um, and say that we were Cooper Union students and could we do X, Y, Z. So this is at Industria Super Studios, which was, there's still places like this in the city now. I'm not sure this one's still around, but it's basically where they shot a lot, a lot of, um, uh, fashion um, advertising and editorial stuff. And so they gave us this studio, which at the time would have cost over $1,000 a day. And there was even a guy to help us. And uh, they lent us all this, this really super fancy pro photo. Um, maybe that's a Swiss brand. Anyway, so a very, very fancy lighting equipment. Um, even the, the backdrop, they gave us all this stuff. Um, and we made this um, portrait. Um, so untitled, they're all untitled and then there's parenthetical titles. So untitled Paramount Nude. And here basically we're playing with the idea that, you know, the bohemianism, right, of young artists that we would all be um, sleeping together. In this case, so this Paramount Hotel was designed by Philippe Stark. So they have these, it's kind of, it still looks kind of cool to me, but all the furniture and this is uh, this big, the headboard is like a, a, a frame. Uh, with just black in it and, and they're tiny rooms. And so is Egan, Ian Schrager, who's still doing projects around. And then all the design was Philippe Stark. And they have, I don't think there's still, but it's amazing lobby with this crazy Philippe Stark uh, furniture. He's a very famous designer, many of you probably know. So he designed stuff for 
for the hotel. And again, this goes back to Shannon, who's in the center with the red hair. Her parents were in town, I think for graduation. We were in two different classes. Um, so there was basically like half the group graduated one year ahead of the other. So I think her parents were in town for graduation. But in any case, we got them to give us the keys to the room um, after they left, but before checkout time. And we came in and used the room to take this um, picture. Um, this is another one where Shannon called. Uh, this is a place called Angelica uh, Film Center that's still around. And this is like an indie movie uh, place. Um, kind of the big indie movie place in New York, has the most screens anyway. So that's where you go to see art movies. And they were very nice. They turned on the projector for us, which uh, you can kind of see some um, light effects from. But again, we brought in our own lights. At this point, we're using a mix of, of flash and hot lights. I think this one might be done with flash. So this is at the end of the night after the last movie, they let us in and we took um, a series of these photographs and we're just wearing pajamas. We kind of have some discussion before the shots about costumes, matching costumes, what are we going to wear, um, stuff like that. So they're, um, yeah, still, you know, still tableau photography, totally faked, you know, I don't know, it's totally set up uh, photographs. Um, this one, um, well, I don't know. I will just point out the gap bag. So this is kind of maybe one of the more important pictures because you see the gap bags. So we glommed onto the idea of, uh, well, we realized the gap had, uh, oh, sorry. So the gap is roughly like H&M or, um, do you have that there? Anyway, any kind of fast fashion sort of chain and they're still around, um, but just in the States. They have the Gap, Banana Republic and Old Navy. And you'll see their stores, I think, in mostly in the United States and Canada, uh, but they're a big company. And uh, they had a very, they had a bunch of stores all over the city and they had a very, gen they had a store very, very close to our school. And they had a, or two stores actually, and they had a very generous return policy, which was as long as the tags are still on it, you know, you just throw the stuff in the bag and they scan it and hopefully you have a credit card and they just put it back on your card. So no questions asked, um, which not all stores are as nice as them. So they, uh, we abused them thoroughly. We would buy, uh, multiple matching outfits. You know, someone would go in, maybe not, we wouldn't all go shopping, but some one or two people would go and buy three or four matching outfits for everybody. And then we would, so this is in a Conrad's furniture store, which is kind of a proto Ikea British chain. A lot of people think this is somebody's uh, loft, but if you look at closely, um, you can see um, the price tags on some of the furniture and also just the setup. You know, you kind of get the idea that it's a furniture store. Um, and once again, calling, this was actually before they opened. So we called, the store was actually kind of across the street from our school. So we called, can we come in before you open and take a picture? And that's that. So, but we did purposely include the gap bags in this shot. And then you can see these, um, what is it? Like 1992 spring, these terrible, this is so 90s, right? These khakis and this mattress plaid. Okay, I'm probably going a little slow. Uh, so this is uh, Wooster Street, Gap Vampires. This is taken outside the gallery. So Soho is one of the areas in New York City where they've preserved um, the cobblestones. They even redid some of them recently, but this again, matching Gap outfits, black jeans, black tank tops. And, you know, we did some color correction to make us look a little more vampire-y. This is the one, and it is really hard to see, in every picture, one of us is actually taking the picture and it's Cindy Sherman style, if you know her work. She actually shows these on purpose sometimes. I think we went to lengths to hide them, although you can see it in the nude one. Anyway, sorry, air cable release. So this is before you know remote control um, technology and it's basically a physical, like a bulb that you squeeze. And then these can be as long as like 50 feet. And then you squeeze the bulb and the air presses the button. Um, so for film cameras, these are really great and they still make them. So here Craig is actually stepping on the air cable release and he probably would like count to three or something. We would usually take some Polaroids, look at them, discuss our poses, and then maybe take two or three um, exposures for each um, shot because again, it was rather costly. So this is a combination for the photo nerds here. It's a combination of long exposure and flash. So you see us with lit with flash and then the fact that you can see the streets is probably maybe, I'll say like a one second exposure or something. Um, 
gap grunge times squares. This is like right after Kurt Cobain killed himself or just this whole idea of like grunge. And these um, again are outfits basically from the gap and we're in Times Square and it's cold. And okay, Art in America Library, we had um, also interned for an artist named Walter Robinson, who was working at the time at Art in America. So he helped get us into, um, this is a, a, a family uh, named the Brants who owns both Interview Magazine, Art in America, and they're super rich like horse people. Um, this, is there another one? No, okay. So um, in this one, we're actually, you know, getting into the gap stuff. And so the idea is that we're researching the art historical antecedents of these t-shirts. So you'll see like Ellsworth Kelly, um, Kenneth Noland. There's actually two of these. So if you go to the show, there's another one where you kind of see us, we actually pulled books from the library that had um, basically like color field painting from the sixties and seventies. And again, this just ridiculous nineties um, fashions with the crazy colored jeans. Um, and so I think this gets into, uh, yeah, this is a good point to introduce. Well, this is why the slide is here. Okay, so we took all these pictures and there's more of them in the show. There's roughly, I think there's 25 in the show, 20? Anyway, whatever, there's, there's a few more, but we took all these pictures um, at some point I think before we had taken all the pictures that were in the show, but at some point we had a bunch and we brought them to Colin. We printed them 20 by 24 inches um, at school. We brought in this portfolio to Colin and uh, it, it was, get, I guess it was getting on into the spring, right? So we were, it was, let's just say it was like March or something. We were all worried about what are we gonna do for our show? And Colin, we were worried about what we were gonna do for our show from the beginning and wanted to talk about what we were gonna do for our show. Colin was much more interested in um, having a class with us. Like, I think he would have liked um, Hans to invite him to teach a class. So he, much of his uh, rationale for doing all of this was um, to work with some Cooper Union students. And so we did have these weekly classes and there was the smoke filled room, seven people, um, mostly discussing art, art theory. He would give us readings. We talk a lot about shows that were up at the time. And then we would always want to get back to or talk to talk about what we were going to do for our show. And Colin really stiff armed us on that well into the spring. Like, no, we're not going to talk about that. Or, you know, we'll get to that later kind of thing. Um, at a certain point, we did start talking about institutional critique, which is a form, I guess, Andrea Frazier would be maybe my most famous example of an institutional critique artist. Her um, piece about the Philadelphia Museum of Art, uh, that video everyone should see um, is freaking amazing. So um, that's a great example of, it's both institutional critique and it's extremely humorous and short. So everyone should watch that. Um, but um, we, the institutional critique was a form that was, um, you know, had some traction. And uh, we came around to the idea of doing a show that would be a critique of institutional critique. So I believe that was kind of the uh, impetus for our first show. That was that was the brief. We're going to do an inst a, a critique, a show that's a critique of institutional critique. So we we're going to choose something to critique that was totally empty. So instead of directly critiquing the gallery system or ourselves or whatever else you might name, we we're going to critique the Gap, which is this store which is totally empty and meaningless. It's just a retail store. It's just a part of the capitalism. It doesn't mean anything. There's nothing really to critique. And we got very quickly into uh, garbology, which is a real academic field. And we found that in our first foray, we were walking by the Gap store near our, our school. We, the, they had put their trash out in clear bags. So it attracted us. We started going through it. We immediately found $18 in cash and a whole bunch of just interesting stuff. Like if you were interested in the Gap, there were like, um, job applications, memos from managers, from one manager to another, um, uh, uh, sales associates handbooks, loss prevention manuals, just all their corporate culture was laid bare. They did not have a shredder. So these are just a few examples of like um, up here on the right, you know, sales report with some great graphics and then these just different kinds of uh, paperwork that we found. And the real treasure again was in the um, some of these manuals and flashcards, so or, or tests that the uh, employees would take. So, 
by um, this uh, Jeremy here took this uh, quiz. So the gap act, greet, approach, product information, add on, close the sale, thank the customer. And so this is something they would actually do. So unlike most stores, they really were kind of on top of you. So it was like, hi, and then, you know, really trying to talk to you about the clothes and you're like, leave me alone. And then uh, the reason I've got this on here, and I hope you can see it, but down here at the bottom, I don't know if it's cut off or not. For me, it is. Anyway, number five says, why is the fitting room a great place to sell? And Jeff, Jeremy got right to the essence, which is you have them undressed and at your use. Um, which is just a beautiful, beautiful answer. Um, so we have here looking at stuff from our show. This is more like, um, oh, this is the actual, you know, this is like a, sorry, um, a manifesto for, you know, every customer will be greeted, more of the same stuff, the Gap Act, um, some of their uh, protocols, pictures from stores. So we're now researching. Um, uh, we had an artist come visit us as part of our class, an artist named Dennis Balk, and he was a, from CalArts, which uh, I don't know where all of this research-based art start, stuff started, but all of our art, I think, qualifies as research-based, and he said to us, every art project has to start in the library. So we went to the library, we found exactly two articles about the gap, you know, one in like a Business Week magazine and one in thing in Wall Street Journal, and then we wrote to the gap. Uh, which we have the letter in their response that we had requests from many students, blah, 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 and they sent us their annual reports. This is actually a picture from their uh, annual report. This is a picture of an actual Gap store. So we're kind of studying uh, their, uh, you know, their, their retail, uh, the way, you know, sorry, their retail architecture, and then also their uh, corporate culture. Okay, so now this is our first show, and we have, they used a lot of ziggurat forms. I don't think I've uh, example pictures, but you have to trust me, like where they put their um, sweaters were like these kind of ziggurat form um, tables and different, yeah, it was just like a form some architect designed for retail displays. So there'd be a stack of folded sweaters on a little stepped thing. So we kind of use that motif over and over again. So this is like a scab wall in the gallery and we cut this out um, of the wall. And then it's pretending here as if the wall is being held up by old gap shoe boxes. Here we have, this is um, just a, a wheeled uh, form. It's in the show. Many of you maybe have seen this stuff, right? With a plant and a bunch of gap trash. Um, this is called slot wall, which they still make. And it's designed to like hold, so you can like hang a purse or a shirt. And then I think the most important part here is our um, texts and wall paintings. So we have three. And so the first one here, um, I'm not sure you're gonna see more than this here. So I'll just tell you, um, this is from their loss prevention manual. So it's like how to keep people from stealing things from the store, which is important to them. So what might happen, and there's like flashcards, but what might happen if you can find a shoplifter? And the answer was a young boy might start crying, a middle-aged housewife may become indignant, a group may become belligerent and or profane. So we liked the, a group may become belligerent and or profane. Um, the women in the group made us change it. It's actually in the gap materials, actually a young girl might start crying, but we just changed it. Oh, there you go, right? And so that was, and this was actually painted by, by hand by a sign painter. Um, this is from the Gap Act, right? Every customer will have their needs determined and merchandise suggested to meet those needs. Again, with the ziggurat, sort of a sculpture we made, there's a light behind it. It's a little hard to see because it's daylight, but there's light emanating from behind just pieces of slot wall. It's very simple, just pieces of slot wall screwed into the wall. Um, and so obviously you're in a gallery, right? So the idea I think is pretty blatant here, right? So it's like you're walking into a gallery and I, I tell my students this when we go around to galleries, I'm like, listen, these are just retail spaces. These are just stores. Like you don't need to act scared, you know, don't touch anything. But beyond that, like there's nothing sacred, holy or special about this place. So I think that, you know, to us, um, this quote from the Gap Act really spoke to the idea of the gallery as a, a kind of a retail space. This um, is a digital folk. You can see the difference between the scan slides, but here's the same text again. Um, I think I have this in here because it shows we made a couple of these um, twin towers and um, those were actually some of our favorite buildings in the city. And they were also meant to imitate what I don't think you see as much, but you still see sometimes there's some kind of portal or something letting you know that there's a sensor um, system in the store. And so these have little red LEDs right about there. Um, and it's meant to imitate a um, 
rate theft prevention system. On this wall, um, oh, it says wandering with no specific intent or knows what they want, but won't tell what it is. And that is from the sales associates flashcards. And so it's a customer type, wandering with no specific intent or knows what, right? Or they know what they're looking for, but they won't tell you. So that's, I don't know, one of, they had these kind of flashcards and then you're supposed to have no ways of reacting to them. This is a close up of the thing with the plant that I showed you earlier. So it's stuffed with gap trash. And I think actually pretty kind of interesting stuff about the GAP Act, like I mentioned, notes from, so Regis Philburn and wife and Larry Fish, Fishburn um, came into the store that day. Um, at one point when we really got into the garbology, we um, went to the yellow pages, which is the internet for old folks. We found out that there were over 20 GAP stores in Manhattan. The gallery had a pickup truck and we took that around and went to uh, like 20 gap stores. We had people, this is unimaginable today, I guess, um, definitely illegal. We had, you know, half the group, you know, it was a little, little pickup truck. So we had half the group sitting in the back of the pickup truck. We'd stop this. A lot of the stores were in Midtown or Uptown. So we would, you know, drive around, go into their trash. People would be sorting trash in the back of the pickup truck as we drove to the next location. So we kind of did a night, a blitz of uh, gap trash and got a lot of good stuff, including like the shoe boxes. This is where we were able to get like kind of bulk bulk trash um, just by driving around to the different stores. This is in the show in Zurich. Um, again, I hope many of you saw it or will see it. It's going to be up till January. Um, and the idea here being that you could um, become part of this. One of the things that attracted us to the Gap was their um, what they were putting in, out in magazines at the time, which was this Individuals of Style campaign. And the idea behind the Individuals of Style campaign, best as I can understand it, is like by wearing a black t-shirt, you can be more of an individual. And so it was uh, pictures, there were a few artists, it was a lot of um, directors, um, creative types. So they got in, uh, this one's actually Dennis Leary. And so you, they got creative people to wear their clothes. And then they had this gobbledygook um, uh, text oftentimes underneath, um, right? Oh, there we, here we can see a little better. Wandering with no specific intent, it has something specific in mind, but it doesn't tell what it is. And then, so here we have, there's the Dennis Leary bus stop ad. And then here's the fake individuals of style uh, portrait that we made of Colin. So that setup that you just saw, and this is the version of it that we had in New York. Um, you know, we're offering people, you know, to have, that we would make one of these. Um, and this one, which is square, uh, we actually used as um, an ad in our forum. And my advice to everyone here is that if possible, as a young artist, um, to get sued by a large corporation, um, unless you're rich, in which case you're already set as a young artist. But if you can get sued, like that's instant press, like big corporations sues young artists. And I think that's kind of what kept us going. I think there was a chance we would have stopped after that first show, but we got a bunch of press because the gap wasn't happy. Colin had, a, you know, always had a free, um, he had a deal with the with Art Forum, he did some light electrical work for them and he always had a quarter page ad. And we decided to use ours to uh, put this in the magazine. And um, we got cease and desist letter from them. Some of the collectors for the gallery were friends of ours. So they agreed to take it on. The end of it was like, we could have taken it to the Supreme Court. In the United States, we have something called fair use, even though we were violating their copyright because we were commenting on it, right? It's a criticism is a type of fair use. And so we probably could have won, but we also would have needed a lot of money to pay the lawyers. So we just agreed to never do it again and sign something saying that, which we didn't want to do it again anyway. So that was fine. Um, but getting that press, I think, I do think helped us, you know, kind of continue. And so we have these seven shows. And I'm just going to try to go through these as quickly as I can. So this is our second show. It's called Clear. Uh, the clear reference is in part to Scientology, right? So it's a level that you would reach in the um, religion. Scientology is clear, um, like Tom Cruise is clear. And then the other thing that was happening at the time is there were a lot of clear products. So Zima is one people might know or remember, which was like a clear beer. They actually had Crystal Pepsi for a brief period, which was just normal Pepsi without the um, caramel coloring. And everything was clear for product wise it was just like clear this clear that 
So that was the reason for that. And so this is our second exhibition. They're all in the same space. Here we have this scab wall. It was going to be knocked down anyway. So it was a wall that had been put up for the previous show. And we we're like, whoa, 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 we'll do something with that. So we put our Club 2000 on and then we kind of artfully broke it. Like if we had really demolished it. So we actually pre-cut. And the one you see in Zurich is the same treatment. So we kind of pre-cut and actually took away material so that it would fall in a cool way. It doesn't make as much sense as a standalone sculpture in the show in Zurich, but you know, whatever. Um, so this says our Club 2000 when you walk in, you have these chroma key colors, right? Which are like what they use for Weatherman. They're still used today actually a lot in digital stuff. So the chroma key green and chroma key blue. And then essentially the show is a series of photographs of us um, with different taxidermied animals. This is probably the best one. Uh, reference to Raiders of the Lost Ark and Shannon uh, facing the cobra. And oh, oh right, we'd noticed that they were taking a lot of pictures, uh, doing a lot of fashion photography at the Cooper Union. They would pay, and you, there's stuff, Law and Order episodes. I don't know, Cooper Union will um, let you film or shoot there, you know, for money. And at the moment, the Bauhaus style. So John Haydick had uh, gutted this. Um, it, it's a really old building, like uh, Abe Lincoln spoke there. So he had gutted the building in the 1970s and turned it into a, his Bauhaus vision. And so that, um, sorry, we, you know, like we saw some supermodels and got the idea to do a, you know, a series of pictures at um, school. So here we have Snake and then we, got, we made all the outfits ourselves. So we're kind of moving away from the gap. So we have a snake, um, seagull, skunk. Uh, the Scooby Union, Scooby Union is famous for having a round elevator. So that's in the round elevator. There's a squirrel here. And um, this one somewhere has a crow. Oh, yeah, there. And again, uh, Gillian actually uh, pictured here, um, pretty much made all the outfits. And oh, here's some better close ups with the snake. Again, I think this is kind of the best one. Wide angle. Um, weasel, crow. And so these are 30 by 40 photographs and the originals prints of these are in the show. We use these giant thumbtacks. So actually the same ones you're looking at here are the ones that we exhibited in 1994, I guess that was. Um, there were some other images that weren't in the front room that were from the same time period. So we're playing around with different kinds of group representation. So this one's called Puzzle Party. We had a friend who was collecting these sort of 70s uh, photo shirts. And then uh, puzzles are really cheap at the thrift store because who wants a used puzzle? And so they're, we're at a light table here with like, I don't know, gosh, you know, 20 puzzles. Um, this is at a 7-Eleven in New Jersey. This isn't a great crop, but you can actually see a cop. And then 7-Eleven, you know, is like a, sort of like those Migro mini kind of stores. So usually gas, oftentimes open 24 hours. And we've got some like Steven Sprouse fashions. And we're using the pickup truck here, so the camera's up high. Um, also in this show, oh, right, we went to England. You know, we did a bunch of shows in Europe. You're not going to see everything, right? We're going to actually end pretty soon. We went to England. We were in a show in England, and somebody was like, oh, have you never heard about pose bands? And so it turns out, and this would be something I would make a note of, and you can look up pretty easily, so pose band. And there were a bunch of guys in England in the 70s, and we weren't the first artists, obviously, to do this, right? Be a band that just makes album covers. And so there were a couple guys in the 70s and they would do it as a sort of as a more of a performance event. So they would pose and like hold a pose for a while, looking cool. And then there's photographs of these performances. But um, we liked that idea. And, you know, the, and so this that's sort of the impetus for the drum kit. So the drum kit here is in a black room with uh, soundproofing, like egg crate soundproofing all by itself. It's like a uh, What's that? 10 feet is like three meters. So it's like a three meter by three meter black room. It's like uh, all black uh, uh, and just with a spotlight. And then this is a this is a miniature drum kit, super, super tiny, like, um, gosh, 10 centimeters tall. And um, it says our Club 2000 on the front. And uh, we made an addition of these, I think, for the, no, we did. We made an addition of these for the um, Kunsthalle, but that is, the original that is uh, was actually stolen from a show. 
Um, this is our third show, Night in the City, and I'll just kind of really just very briefly go through these. So um, we have, again, another kind of demolition experiment. This was a, another room that was going to go anyway. So Colin was constantly reconfiguring the gallery. He always had two rooms, and then the back office was half the gallery. But this two-room configuration was something he made artists deal with. But uh, for a period there, there was the room that you saw the drum kit in, and that was up for a couple of years and he decided to finally get rid of it and again we were like whoa whoa we'll do something with that so in this instance and that's not rep this isn't represented in the um, Zurich show because it's just too much cacophony but there's actually a button you can see here and when you press the button it completes a, a loop and it was uh, continually playing suicidal tendencies um, institutionalized which is like a skate rock band it's a really cool song all I wanted was a Pepsi the older people here would remember it or you can look it up suicidal tendencies institutionalized. It's a pretty good song. So that's just demolished room with this soundtrack, but it, and it was loud if you press the button. And then we were using this um, museum style display, right? So you can see that we've painted the walls beige, which is something if you go see a photo show of black and white photography, they almost always paint the walls um, beige or gray. And so we're using this is totally fake. And it's also in the show in Zurich. And it's meant, I don't know, just to imitate um, museumological display. These screws are also fake. And so these are just really plastic box frames. And then so the show is called Night in the City. And so we're basically just dealing with and part of the continuum of the history of New York City street photography and the city at night. And so here we have Starbucks who just come to the city. And so this is their trash uh, with the Frappuccino here. Uh, there's another one of Taco Bell that's not here. Cyber Cafe, woo! See, this is where a place you could go and go on surf the web. Um, this is Astor Place, um, again, next to Cabrini, and there's this famous sculpture there, this kind of cube that spins, and this was a skate spot, so you can kind of see a skateboard here. So these are skater girls, and Gillian did this, and she actually kind of, you know, did this candid shot. This is the Sharf Shack, so an artist, Kenny Sharf, uh, who's still around, you know, graffiti artist, kind of associated a bit, definitely from around the same time as um, Keith Haring. And he had a little store in Soho um, called the Sharf Shack that was in an old, um, because it's a historic district, they couldn't tear it down. So in Soho, this used to be a newsstand. It's still there. And then it's been all kinds of things from a soup stand to like, a, you know, Lancome promotion. And so for a couple of years, it was the Sharf Shack and you could buy Kenny Sharf coffee mugs and t-shirts and stuff like that. And it was actually, you know, it's pretty cool. Um, he paints a lot of cars, Kenny Scharf, kind of cool artist. The line for the movie Kids. So, you know, it's just kind of about making the work about the time that it was in. If you look at a picture, let's say of, well, any place that has a movie theater in it, and then you see what movie's playing and you can kind of tell what year it is, right? So this is the line for the movie Kids. And I was in that movie just as an extra. Um, Wired Magazine. I think this was also like a cyber cafe. DMC was a store. If you're making notes, Bernadette Corporation. So Bernadette, just like you'd spell it, Corporation was another collaborative that was working in New York City at the same time as us. They were very different. They were really interested in, they would throw parties at nightclubs. They did um, fashion shows, very different kind of work, but definitely something interesting to look up and look at if you uh, like. And so DMC uh, was Documents and Manifestos Cafe. And that was a retail space the Bernadette Corporation had for um, a year or so. And so this is just super long exposure at night. Um, these were actually medium format, so six by seven, a large negative. This is large format. And this is my favorite art club image because I'm a photo nerd, right? And I teach photography. And this is also the poster for the show. Um, and what we've done here, if you're a photo nerd, before Photoshop, right, if you wanted to fix um, the, the way a building looked in your picture, right? A building will tend to like kind of lean back in a photograph. Um, view cameras have movements. You can actually change the relationship of the film plane and the lens. And so what we've done here is taken a Milton Glaser design. So Milton Glaser is a famous graphic designer who did this and the UPS logo and a bunch of other stuff. Um, I guess he's somebody else you could look up if you wanted. He just passed away, G-L-A-S-E-R. So his design studio, he was a Cooper Union alum. His design studio produced this um, logo, which I'm sure this cup company just stole. But anyway, this is probably the most common coffee cup in New York at the time. And I'm really dragging this out. What we did was with the four by five camera, we made the cup, which was more V-shaped into a cylinder. So just total photo nerd 
you know, it's a little bit of studio photography in that show. Um, this was our show in 1996. This is our fourth show. And the um, it's called Soho So Long. So you're looking at the outside. Um, we have a stop. And then it says really small um, stop on in while staying at the mega hotel. And so they had just built a ginormous um, uh, Soho Grand Hotel basically across the street from the gallery. And the hotel owner actually came in just because he was curious. So I guess it worked. We also soaped out the windows and uh, made it look as if an Old Navy, which is, a again, a, the Gap owns Old Navy, Banana Republic, and the Gap. Old Navy is actually their biggest, most profitable division. So we soaped out the windows, which is kind of an old style way of like saying that the store is closed. And we made the sticker saying that an Old Navy would be opening in the fall. And Old Navy actually did open the following year um, a couple blocks away um not there and then as you go on oh we did uh we made uh drawing center planner so the show's kind of about soho and so as you go on you see that um this were just is where we stored the sign when, when we were closed and then as you it's just trying to explain this well it's actually the same way it works in the show in zurich so you come into the gallery this is a view from the front door of the gallery you come into the gallery and you see the back of what's basically kind of a stage set you know, these are just springs and this kind of lightweight kind of construction. And then you have to you have to push through these doors is the only way to get in. And so when you turn around, then you see, and we've intentionally misspelled Sharp Shack and kind of made our own. By this time, the Sharp Shack was actually uh, gone. And so the show was about Soho. And this was actually, I think we're getting into uh, where we do some muckraking uh, journalism. And so um, what's in the show maybe isn't as important as what we uh, made for the show, which is a book that is available at the show in Zurich um, called So So Long. And we interviewed a bunch of art dealers. This is a meeting of art dealers. We don't know what they were talking about. Colin just got us into the gallery and we here we're using a panoramic camera. So we've got um, Andrea Rosen, Matthew Marks, Pat Hearn, Colin, Friedrich Petzl, Carol Green, um, Stefano Basilico, <clears throat> and that's a light box. And this doesn't really have anything to do with anything. It's a meeting of art dealers. We think they might've been talking about organizing an art fair or deciding what night to have their openings on. What we really did and what you see on the table here are individual interviews with mainly art dealers. And we asked them all the same dumb questions, stuff from Soho. This is, um, this is the display, um, from a clothing store that we borrowed. This is um, a work attributed to Basquiat that someone found in Soho. Um, we had, I think you saw, um, right, this vending machine. So it means like you're kind of in a waiting room. And then this setup, and the idea would be that you could actually, you could buy the book. I think it was like five bucks um, bound, kind of like reader style. And um, these are the pictures that are in the book. And so it actually took pictures of all the uh, people and ask them all the same questions and they're all really dumb. It's just very straightforward. I don't know if it's dumb, but you know, just said very straightforward. When did you move to Soho? What do you think has changed since you've been there? Do you think you moved to Chelsea? So this was a point when Soho, the shirt stores were really taking over, rents were going up and galleries were, and actually Pat Hearn, uh, Colin's girlfriend was one of the people who started this along with Matthew Marks, um, got in very early. Uh, Dia, uh, the Dia Foundation already had a museum up there, I think didn't hurt, but the very, very far west side, and it still exists, I think it's the main center of gravity for art galleries in New York, but it's not easy to get there on the subway. So it's like between 10th and 11th Avenue and roughly 17th to 30th Street and those, um, all pretty much all the galleries, in, yeah, there's hardly any galleries in Soho at all. Um, so these are some of the pictures. This person wanted to be anonymous. I'll just say it's, well, I'm, uh, yeah, I won't say who it is. Um, people were really nice to us. I can't imagine this happening today, honestly. But so Leo Castelli, you know, at this building that he owns, 420 West Broadway, he kind of started Soho. He bought this building, brought his gallery there. Before that, you know, this is the 1970s, early 70s. Artists were in Soho. Soho didn't have street lights. It was full of rats. You would definitely get mugged there. It was dirty. And I would say Leo, you know, like the, in, the, in much the way that Pat um, started Chelsea, Leo started Soho. And he was really uh, gracious. And um, 
his wife, Ileana Sonnabend, who showed Jeff Koons, Vishili Weiss, um, also had a gallery in the building, ex-wife Ileana. Also, again, really nice to just, you know, answered all these, I will say they're kind of dumb questions, you know, just really, I mean, I, I don't know, whatever. So you see the book for yourself. It is out on view and um, it's, uh, it's a historical document. Um, Carol Green, who was already in Chelsea, she was kind of a Chelsea pioneer. Um, we would work with the people, ask them where they wanted to pose. This is Stefano Basilico, and this is the Judd Foundation, which if you come to New York now, you can finally visit. But for like 40 years, there was just this space, here it says not open to the public. There was this Donald Judd building on the corner of like Mercer and Prince Street that you couldn't go to. Lisa Spellman, 303 Gallery, cool long exposure at night. Different people from the group took different photographs. I know some of them I took uh, and some people took other ones. You know, it was like organizing with all these people to do this. You know, I will say we had, you know, being a group helps. So different people did the interviews, different people did, that was made it possible. There's about 25 people in the book. Um, this is uh, Rob Pruitt and uh, Tom Borghese, who at the time were working in retail and thought they were going to open a gallery, but never did. This is Jose Freire, um, who famously disappeared with all his artist money last year. Um, Walter Robinson, right? Who's a critic. Um, he's more of a, he's a really famous artist. He was a big famous artist in the 80s and has made a comeback in the last 10 years. But at the time he was working at um, Art in America magazine. And they have this great guy on the cell phone here. Um, is kind of awesome, Friedrich Petzl. So, and you know, people did choose. We talked to him like, where do you want to pose? He was like, oh yeah, I like the graffiti in the parking lot across the street. Andrea Rosen, definitely this is her favorite Japanese restaurant. Again, flash with long exposure. Um, Pat Hearn, definitely wanted to be taken uh, in front of the Soho Psychic sign. Um, Colin was reluctant to pose. And then uh, 1997, very similar. I think we found this model, this journalism model, uh, to be really attractive. And so we did a show about 1970. At this point, I thought we would do, in 97, we would do 70, 98, we would do 80, and so forth. But we just did this one. But so basically, you see us recycling the planter from the first show. And then a pretty simple show, interviewing artists about the year 1970. Again, with a list, the same questions. We asked everybody, how do you think the art world has changed since 1970? Um, do you have any advice for young artists today? What do you remember from 1970? So on and so forth. If you go to the show, I really recommend you. If you're just going to listen to one, uh, Vito Acconci, chain smoking, gravelly voice, and he recounts the information show at MoMA, which is something if you're taking notes, information show. Hans Hacke had a really cool piece in that about the Vietnam War and um, Vito's piece in that show. And so this is early conceptual art, right? 1970 and MoMA kind of embracing conceptual art. And so he just gives a really kind of simple description of his, or I don't know, whatever, a good description of his piece in the information show and talks about some other stuff. And then we have um, Henry Flint, Issa Genskin, Carolee Schneemann. Um, I want to say Alex Katz and... Uh, Simon Sirigio, uh, Nikki Logis. Okay, I'm seeing you. I should probably be wrapping it up. So, and then you could, so because it was a bit of a cacophony there, so we had the sound on, but obviously you couldn't listen to anybody. And so similar to So So Long, we had a setup where you could watch the tapes individually um, with these IKEA couches. And then this setup, that was just what we interviewed people in front of. And so we had the same background, except Carolee, who wanted to have her own. Um, this was basically our last kind of original show. So Night of the Living Dead author, we boarded up the gallery windows. We have this sign that says Chelsea later because we're going to move to Chelsea, which actually the gallery does eventually. And essentially, you know, there's a couple of things going on here. We're talking about what's going on. This is Giuliani era. Things were really changing in New York. You literally had it in uh, bars, big signs that said no dancing, which was like totally nuts. Um, but the bars were getting these huge fines because people were dancing and the bars didn't have something called a cabaret license, which they have finally resolved. But I think the kids today don't even know what dancing is. So it's just like, I, I don't know. It's a really crazy thing. And so they were cracking down on quality of life crimes. I got arrested for jumping a turnstile, you know, it was that kind of stuff. And so we're like, well, what is a cop? And the answer is a cop is the punishing enforcer of an oppressive regime. So you walk in, 
cast a phalanx of cops and you get to these um, nice benches that Leo actually lent us. These are Barcelona chair Ottomans and Leo lent us this and you walk through the cops. It's totally dark. This is more accurate to what you would experience. So the windows were blacked out. Your eyes would have to adjust. You had the little disco light slash cop lights. You walk through the phalanx of cops. They have these spooky um, red lights on for their eyes. And um, this is it with the lights on. And then this is, you know, more accurate again to what it's like. And so you have a Jenny Holzer style LED sign with a text. And the text was basically, so death of the author, we're basically addressing, you know, as we go, went on, we're continually having these meetings with Colin. And so the subject that particular year was like, well, what happened to the death of the author? We came up with this, you know, Roland Barth came up with this in 1968. You know, supposedly we had all this postmodern art, and yet it seems you know authorship is more important than ever. And so that's basically it's a pretty long text. I have a couple of pages here, um, but you can go read it at the gallery. We do criticize ourselves as well, and I think you know basically the the premise is that um, here, well, and because this is the subject of all our work, maybe I'll kind of end with this. You know, um, today's artists nurtured under the sensational auteurs of '80s dead authorship feed like zombies on the reeking corpse of those strategies which have defined more than a decade's worth of commercially successful art. Artists who fashion a product of faux antagonism towards authorship while structuring a career based on capitulation to the market's authorities. I agree with all of this. Um, propagating a signature style, ignore the issues germane to the invention of those strategies as well as of art today, namely the impress oppressive circumstances of consumption determined productions consumption determined production, right? What gets bought determines what gets made. These are the living dead authors and the art industry is in the somnolent obscurity of their night. So there's a bunch more, but I think that is kind of the main point of it. So we call out a few people and kind of expand on that. But um, I think that probably Gabrielle, right, is a pretty good place to stop. Um, these are kind of some outtakes. This is a photograph. We actually have an early Photoshop attempt by me. Um, I did manage though, right? So Craig's actually lying down. I managed to make him into a head. So this is one of the few art club works. Well, the first one I showed you, and then this um, kind of last one here um, where Colin participated and we're um, acting zombies. And then you get into stuff we did in Europe. So I think, right, we, we should probably Yeah, end thanks there. so much for this uh, really sure, rich, sure. Uh, rich talk. We sure. learned a lot, not only about uh, uh, photography, uh, technical um, issues around that uh, representational medium, but then also, of course, about the history and uh, of the city of New York, of the development of the art world, uh, about uh, urbanism, uh, gentrification. So uh, that practice you presented to us um, is um, really immensely rich and dense in content. So that's also why uh, it, it's a lot. It's it a takes lot. some time to unfold, yeah. especially yeah. if you want to give some context. So thanks so much uh, for this effort. Sure. And sharing with us. Yeah. Um, there's more stuff. I'll oh, sorry to interrupt. You know, there's more stuff in the show. We're fortunate. I mean, there's so much space at the Kunsthalle. So some of the work that we did in Europe, but I do consider that a separate practice. Colin, Colin didn't like traveling. We would try to fax with him, and we, we he would participate and talk through our ideas with us, but. I, most of that work was more kind of ad hoc. So you do see that work in the show. I think a lot of it is good, but I think the core of the art club work is what you, you just saw. And, you know, again, I'm not saying there's anything bad about the other stuff you see in the show that we didn't have time to get to, but we, what we saw just now were the seven shows, summer shows that we did with Colin in New York that have some, well, it had, you know, had more of his, his input, let's just say. So, um, yeah. Yeah, really nice. Um, I would encourage, as always, our audience uh, to overcome the threshold and <laughs> join our uh, conversation here that will start. I was wondering um, about this, of course, collective practice. So you were about eight in a slightly changing formation, like Craig Wedlin, Soybin Spring, Sarah Rossiter, William, Rollins, Shannon Pultz that has been mentioned a few times. 
Mm -hmm. and Daniel, Tong, yeah. uh, Julian, Haratani, and you. Right. Um, so there's really just one change. So the woman Sarah Rossiter um, quit after the first show and wrote a really not terrible, but very, I mean, actually, it's all true, but whatever. She wrote a very critical essay in this French magazine called Block Notes um, about the group and kind of the fiction of collaboration, which it is, it's a fiction. I mean, once you get beyond two people, and I know because I've done a lot of collaboration, once you get beyond two, maybe three, two is an ideal number. I, I highly endorse collaboration. I, I love working with other people. And I think as an artist, it can be a way to, it's a great thing. You should at least try it. Maybe it's not for you. A lot of students resist it, but I definitely recommend it. But you know, two's ideal. You can kind of encourage each other in down moments. You can share ideas. You have somebody to hold the camera, whatever it happens to be. Seven, come on, you know. So we basically had to forget who was whose idea something was, or and that was why the we 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 landed on the idea of us taking pictures of ourselves immediately because that was one thing. Oh well, we can all be in a picture together, you know. So that was that was why we went to that immediately. I forget why I broke in. Oh, sorry, just so that one woman resigned and then we brought in Will. Um, so it was always seven. So it's maybe also um, no wonder that kind of your works uh, always unfolded as exhibitions, I would say, um, since there um, is this um, plurality of voices and uh, also tasks uh, that kind of can unfold in a, in a very nice way in, a, in an exhibition environment because everyone uh, can contribute in some way. Uh, but what I've been wondering about also while we're waiting for questions from our audience, of course, um, bring it on. Um, so these shows, you re created them uh, at the Kunsthalle Zurich. Um, and of course, it's a practice that is not um, as easily sellable as other artworks, I, I'd say, or it's maybe more at attractive for institutions. Um, but how have you conserved um, mm. shows to reinstall them? Um, is it all re really? Uh, restaged uh, reproduced or um i i imagine it's a, it's a mix, yeah. documented them uh, and uh, or to which uh, extent is there also a certain sense of invention and adaption in the current show and uh, how did you decide to kind of um disperse them in the room is it just a chronological it's mostly uh, yeah approach? yeah it's mostly chronological you know i mean i think we worked with daniel um you know, it, it's great. The open space that he has set up, you know, worked great for us. Um, uh, artist space was kind of similar, smaller, so we didn't have as much in there. Um, uh, but yeah, essentially, you know, chronological kind of makes make sense as a starting point. Um, also included in the exhibition are some archives um, that artist space curated and, and Daniel's also displaying. And there's some interesting, weird stuff to look at there. Um, but sorry. Oh, I guess, you know, I mean, it's the same problem. I'm actually dealing with, you know, the show originated in New York at Artist Space. I'm actually dealing with Artist Space now because they want, I still have seven boxes there, you know, <laughs> <laughs> they want them gone. So, you know, especially in New York, but I mean, everybody has, you know, they, you know, this is not for profit. Nobody's going to store. We've never, we have, you know, since, as, since Colin's passing, we haven't had a gallery. Um, so we, we had a fair amount of our work in the gallery had storage, the gallery owned art, Colin owned art. Danny was uh, inherited the gallery and 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 the art that Colin owned. So and Colin's art. So we just kind of got snuck in with that. I mean, fortunately, uh, it was mostly photography. So I think a majority of the prints you see in the show are archival, you know, original prints that um, survived. Um, the bigger stuff, you know, we just couldn't store. It's a shame, you know. We had um, we did have nine. 13 inch black and white TVs. And, you know, at some point it's just like, we just, they just got thrown away. I don't know, you know, so the bigger something is, the more likely it's recreated. So the Sharp Shack we remade in New York and shipped here. Um, so also those things, I mean, I think, you know, art is about, you know, I, I, you know, that's this whole thing about minimalism and theatricality, but, you know, so much of, especially for art club, you know, a lot of our work is about theatricality, you know, like think about the 
the lighting, you know, it's something especially Danny's really into, but the way that things are lit in the show, like the drum kit and the the chair for the people getting interviewed. So um, I don't have a problem with the fact that like, so all the bigger things, the Sharf Shack, all of the slot wall constructions. I mean, this is just a construction material that you can buy for, you know, whatever, $50 a sheet. And there's definitely, there's some fabrication involved, but in the long run, it's like saving that, storing that for 30 years versus remaking it. And it just makes more sense um, to me to remake it. And I, that idea of the art club work being, you know, the original, I mean, I buy into it to a certain point, but at the same time, you know, if the idea is coming across, we actually made them better, you know, so, and especially in this show in Switzerland, the, the craftspeople that Daniel has working for him, oh my God, that wall with the <laughs> shoe boxes, like, is like, you know, and like when we made it, you know, it's all lumpy. And when you look up close, you see drips and stuff. So yeah. it's in the, it, everything looks better than it ever did. <laughs> <laughs> and so, um, but yeah, there's, there's, there's a mix, uh, but, um, you know, the prints, the flat stuff is what we were able to store easily. That's what's great about photography, mm -hmm. right? You just have a box. It's not, I mean, it's still, it's not nothing, but it's, it's a lot easier to store than a sculpture or a painting. Um, and over the years, we've, you know, thrown out frames to save space and just saved prints. Uh -huh. But um, um, yeah, so I think, yeah, it was basically Danny's philanthropy and, um, uh, we, we knew we didn't want to throw it away. So it was storing a bunch of boxes and then that was part of the impetus to do the show. You know, it was like, let's, we got to do something with this stuff, you know, so that. Yeah, this, this whole the process. <laughs> no, go ahead. Go ahead. Um, then also you disbanded sort of as a group uh, in the early noughties or with the year 2000 with a show uh, that you couldn't mention now because I kind of cut in a bit. Um, so you, at a certain point, you stopped collaborating or uh, kind of ended the project of um, Art Club 2000. Um, maybe you could say just a few words about that. And also, I've been wondering in which sense that would have, it would have maybe changed as a practice moving into the Nordies with everything that happened to New York in the early 2000s. Yeah. But we will also answer a question by Luca Klett, uh, who joins our discussion. Uh, but first to you, Patterson. Uh, sure, yeah. So, uh, you know, I think it was understood fairly early on. We built it into the name. 2000 was kind of a funny thing that was popping up a lot in the early 90s. It was, and we had a small collection of ephemera, you know, like video store 2000, this and that 2000. So our club 2000 was definitely, you know, I, we, I think in our work, we always try to have some humor and that was, you know, it's meant to be um, kind of a funny futuristic name. We're also 19. So 2000, well, it's never going to happen or like, we'll, we'll be dead by, you know, but really it came around quite quickly. So I, you know, there was always just an understanding that we would stop in 2000 and our final show, um, honestly, isn't worth, worth looking at given the time we did uh, in 1999, we did a retro disrespective and we'd sold a few prints. I think over the years, we'd had some sales of some of those more iconic early photographs that I showed you. Um, and also from our second show and we sold a few photo prints here and there, but essentially all this stuff, we still had all those cops and that light box and the um, you know, the Jenny Holzer sign. We had a lot of great stuff in the basement at that point in 1989. So we brought that all up. Um, the artist who had the show just before us had made a really cool kind of stage plinth. So like a, you know, a plinth maybe, um, you know, 30 centimeters high. And so we just arranged, you know, that filled the room sort of. And so we just arranged everything in a hodgepodge on the plinth. And then we also filled the walls with all like archive snapshots, outtakes, pictures, photographs from magazines. And so that was this little retro disrespective, but it's impossible to put that into this actual retrospective because that's the work <laughs> that's in the show. Um, so that, but they, yeah, that was always in the works. And for me, honestly, I think that that timing was right at that point, you know, people had started having kids and moving away and um, we were already down, you know, as you see in like the last show with the zombies, I think there's four of us left in the city. So it was kind of, you know, it was just, time and um, uh, some people did. Daniel McDonald in particular still has a robust art career. I still make art. Shannon Polt still makes art. Um, other people I can't speak for as much, honestly. I'm not in touch with them 
as much, but I think people also just drifted away from wanting to be um, involved in the art world. What was the other part of your question? Um, let's answer Luca Klett's question okay, first, since cool, yeah. we're uh, dealing with group dynamics here anyways, sure. uh, which he is intrigued in um, asking, um, well, yeah, how the work developed, whether there were frictions, discussions, many arguments, or rather uh, harmony, because also he uh, sees a lot of fun uh, to develop on in those uh, photographs, for example. Um, yeah, I guess wondering whether you also had fun <laughs> while Yeah, together. no, of course. Yeah. Uh, you know, I think, um, absolutely, of course. I mean, you can't get seven people together, an artist especially, with their egos and not, and to me now, I mean, we're going on 30 years with some of this stuff. It's really roughly like 25 years. And so my memory is unclear. I will say, and this is humorous or not, you know, because we only took so many photographs, right? Like we take, let's just say we take five shots of each setup and we go through all this trouble. We'd go to a place, we'd get everybody together. We'd take these pictures but because it was so costly. We'd only have five images. And the biggest fights we would have was over which, image to pick, right? So we'd have to, at times we'd have to vote using post-its. One person would be really unhappy with how they looked in one picture. Another person would be really unhappy with how they looked in another picture. And then we'd have to all vote to like choose which one we were gonna, you know, print. Um, so th those were really like our biggest um, knockdown drag out fights, which I guess just speaks to the vanity of youth. Um, we, I think we had spirited conversations. I don't think conceptually you know we uh, i have a lot of really fond memories like we have a lot of really great times especially traveling around europe getting to go to fashion shows being getting to be fashion models um like just getting to be a famous artist we didn't get any of the money but we had the full experience of you know um uh you know getting to travel for free um and doing shows together and that um once we you know some, sometimes it was hard Sometimes it was hard to settle on an idea or just come up with an idea. But once we did and we were in production mode, that was honestly quite pleasant because with six, seven people, you can get a week's worth of work done in a day. So uh, maybe we got even a little lazy about deciding what to do towards the end because we knew we could, you know, we could get it all done in a couple of days. And um, those, I think what you see most is like the wall murals, right? So it's like representing like, an immense amount of labor, like that, that the what's in the show, the Benetton wall mural with the vultures, like there's hundreds and hundreds of hours of labor in that. But, you know, you get a bunch of young people together and get them painting with a projector and before you know it, it's done. Mm -hmm. um, so that it was actually, that was great. And especially as you multiply it, right? So again, two people would be my ideal number, but if I wanted to make a giant wall mural, seven is also great. And in the cases where we would have people running around, we were always, you know, kind of maybe last minute, um, a lot of times with things. And so we could assign people and we did, have, you mentioned, we had people with different skill sets, people that were good at sewing, people that were good at making photo prints, people definitely were better at sculpture, people that were good at faux painting. We had a lot of, you know, it was art school. So we had learned a lot of different things, but we knew who, or people would volunteer, like they would want to do certain things so that um, uh, the production mode was actually generally really pleasant, right? You're, you have a sense of purpose, you know what you're trying to do. Um, and no, I mean, we're all still friends, you know, it wasn't, um, we we chose people because they were our friends to be in the group. It was like, do you want to do this crazy thing with this crazy art dealer? So we started off from a point of friendship and I'm happy to say like everyone's still alive and we're all still friends. And to my knowledge, there was never really like a fight, you know, where every, well, I mean, Sarah did quit the group, but that was for her own reasons. You know, I think it wasn't, it just wasn't right for her, but um, with that exception, you know, there wasn't anybody, uh, I, and I could be wrong. I mean, maybe somebody was miserable the whole time, but to my mind, you know, people were generally, um, you know, just happy and we were trying to have fun. I think that was an important, you know, try to convey a sense of fun, to try to have it be fun for the audience, if not funny, at least fun or interesting, and for it to be fun for ourselves. And usually when we said yes to an idea or decided to do something, it was because it seemed fun, right? That was like, 
Yeah, we spoke previously a bit about yeah. uh, the notion of yeah. pleasure in art making. Yeah. But let's come to a question uh, by Rafael Gigax, uh, who asks, uh, how do you, did you deal as uh, AC2K with uh, press work? If um, people wanted to ask you for interviews uh, or even uh, how do you deal with that today if a young art historian wants to interview you? We have helped people. Hi, Rafi. Um, we have, there's a great article that Jackie, Jackie McAllister, who passed away a few years ago, did a really nice article in After All magazine about us. And so that grew out of, you know, he interviewed us as a journalist. I don't know if there's a ton of quotes, but we helped him craft the article. Um, Collier Shore interviewed us for Freeze magazine. That one we did handle, it's not my favorite interview, but we did handle that one as a fax. So we, you know, kind of concocted answers as a group to her her questions that way. Um, and we were in Italy and she was in New York. And so that was an interview. We haven't done um, a bunch of interviews as a group per se. Uh, I think there's an article online. I want to say, I mean, you can do an Art Club 2000 search. I think if you do Art Club 2000 Cooper Union, there's an article Danny and I participated in there. And then there's also, it's getting to be maybe it's from four or five years ago. There's an article about us in Art Forum, where again I think Danny and I are interviewed, but I'm not sure if we're quoted. Um, I can't. Re I just can't remember. I, I typically, our you know our deal would be like if someone asked, we'd be like, oh, we I can't speak for the group, and that's what I would say if you asked me now, like to give you an Art Club 2000 quote, I'd just say like I can't do that. <laughs> we're, we're essentially we're a dead artist, right? So. Again, fortunately, everybody is alive, but the way we operate and the kind of the driving principle that helped us make these shows was we didn't make, I think that was something you were asking about, Gabby, was like just, you know, we, we didn't, I mean, obviously things changed and we made compromises, but we didn't make new work. We didn't try to make it like super better or have new ideas. We just tried to keep it true to what we originally um, presented. So it's essentially like being uh, whatever that's called when you take care of the estate of an artist, if that makes mm -hmm. sense. Mm -hmm. There's a name for that. Anyway. Um, maybe a last thing to uh, round off the talk that's now been lasting for one and a half hours already. Uh, but uh, you um, frequently came back in the first part on the notion of research-based um, art practice uh, or even previously referred to this AC2K practice as artistic research, um, a notion that really gained traction over the last uh, decades. Uh, and I've been wonder wondering, um, what would you give as an advice to uh, current art students, um, how to deal uh, or go with around about uh, the term of artistic research, since you're also a teacher? Yeah, cheers. And I've, I mentioned before the talk that my school has a program that's, you know, has, has research based in the title. So I, I know it's very common nowadays. I, I don't think it's a bad thing. You know, even if you're not making research art that you should, you know, uh, try to find out as much as you can about what you're doing, right? So you might have, if you're making messy paintings, like you need to know about Willem de Kooning, you know, so this there's still like artists have, a professional artist has some responsibility to um, to know about our history, to know about theory. Um, I don't know that all art needs to be research-based. And I, you know, I think that the way I see some artists handling it, there's certainly quite a variety um, of ways that people are interpreting that idea. Um, I think our research-based work was also critical. And I would like to think you know, humorous, or at least kind of looking for a slightly funny angle that it would always be, um, you know, a if you could get a laugh out of somebody like that would be like, the absolute best thing. And that um, what I mentioned when I did that talk in Zurich, and I guess bears repeating, you know, is that it, you should try to find the pleasure in art and try to find something, you know, that's fun for you, that's interesting for you. Um, I think, you know, so I mean, someone else will tell you that it's your responsibility as an artist to you know, expose, which I do think Art Club 
did sum up, right? That it's your, uh, you know, it's your responsibility to expose the conditions of production as corrupt and to save the world or whatever. Um, but I think Hans Hawk is a fairly decent example. You know, his art is definitely, um, you know, pretty stringently researched, but um, at the same time, he's, uh, it's definitely, it's also art. It's not just a, a research paper. Um, <laughs> Uh, if that makes sense, but yeah, you know, like enjoy yourself and find something you're interesting in, interested in, and that it seems like it has some potential for fun for you, for your audience. Um, and I feel like I see people doing that. Um, I think a lot of the research space stuff gets off into the digital world a bit, um, and obviously that's that's you know that's something new, and that's that's totally fine. Um, but there's so much available out now for young artists. It's so different. And I, for you all that have grown up with the internet, um, uh, it was a different world. You know, we didn't have as much at our fingertips. Mm -hmm. um, maybe that's a good point to stop. <laughs> maybe. Um, or to conclude this talk, uh, there is still uh, some anonymous uh, audience uh, member wondering why you're sitting uh, in front of a, a green uh, background or of a green screen. So we'll let that open or um, open for projections. <laughs> and <laughs> to be cute, I, no, I teach, so I've been I've been on Zoom for the last two years, and this is my one of my setups. Great. But it could be a cute thing. It could have been if I didn't say something. It's a, you know, it's like a green screen thing. Mm -hmm. So you want to say something about it again? Sorry, no, I just, I, I've been on Zoom for the, because of the pandemic, we've been teaching on Zoom. So I had to set this up just because I, yeah. Okay. It's just from teaching. Well, so um, in New York, it's now uh, still afternoon. Uh, thanks so much for uh, spending your lunch <laughs> with us, being with us, uh, really diving uh, into the immersing into the work of AC2K and also your contributions to that collective. It was a huge pleasure. And I'm looking forward to seeing you again, hopefully in Switzerland or also the US, wherever uh, the path may cross again. And thanks again so much for being yeah. with us, Patterson. Thanks, Gabby. <laughs> I would say uh, people are clapping, with, uh, and I assume they do. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, thank you all for hanging out. Um, thanks for the questions. Cheers. Yeah. I hope, yeah, if you haven't seen the show, I hope you go see it. Um, get the book, or at least read the book. You can read the book for free there. <laughs> yeah, and get some coffee because... Uh, and there's free coffee. Yeah, yeah. And stuff, yeah. There's stuff, yeah, you didn't see. So there's stuff that we managed to... Daniel was great. He really, like, when I was like, we have to have this free coffee. Well, we're in Switzerland. We did this show in Switzerland where we had free coffee. We got, in, we got free coffee. Mm -hmm. I guess, do you all get in for free as yeah. students? Yeah. Oh, yeah. So go get your free coffee. I think it's, I think it's a pretty painless show to see. I hope, I think you don't have to like it, definitely. And, um, and it's getting really old, too. I think it's interesting to see how it ages. Mm -hmm. um, so, well, you know, this is what I, I definitely think we're this generation that was like pre-internet, right? So that's like for most of you all being growing up with it maybe that's uh we're like that we're like that last generation that right maybe that didn't have it and so that might be i don't know how important it is to the work but anyway just to see what people were doing 20 years ago yeah that's a, a nice um, thought to take with us in the evening and uh, still cool. have a good dinner cigarette Thank whatever you. you're See you. Thanks so okay. much. Okay. All right. Ciao. Thanks, Rafi. Thanks, everyone. Bye. Bye. Ciao.